So uh, this is our last regular Sunday. Then, of course, next Sunday is the Transfiguration. Uh, today is also Habitat for Humanity Sunday. Now, what that means is that we have a fellowship dinner. Uh, please plan to stay, fellowship, uh, eat. Uh, we've got pork and sauerkraut and fixins and everything uh, prepared for us next door so that we don't have to rush off. We can stay, we can eat, we can fellowship. And then, of course, um, uh, donations received will be going to Habitat to provide decent, affordable housing uh, for uh, those who need such. Uh, so uh, that's, that's today. Next Sunday after worship, we have our youth group fundraiser brunch, which helps fund youth group activities. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, then we prepare for Lent. Um, and also the men's banquet is Sunday, March 31st, 5 o'clock p.m. Uh, please sign up for that. Um, and uh, uh, it's going to be fantastic program, fantastic food. Everything is good. So, uh, Julie, I think now you are ready. Okay. Um, we're really excited about next Sunday, our Fat Sunday brunch, and we definitely need some youth to help. So, um, if you are available instead of Sunday school, you'll be coming to see me in the kitchen. Um, and I know that our team of youth is fantastic. Every time we have a youth dinner, everybody shows up and everybody does a fantastic job. So um, I don't need to, to worry. Um, also, Friday, this Friday, we have um, a March meltdown, which is sort of our hurrah before Lent as well. And Friday at, from 7 to 10, we rented out the CU Club in Ford City. And we're going to be having bowling and music and games and prizes. And it's all ages. So please come. Um, you can bring a snack to share. We'll provide drinks. And uh, we're really excited about that. So if you can make it, please come. Also what, tonight. What, what, what's the minimum age for Friday night? Um, a week old, probably. One week old. Yeah, one week old. <laughs> okay. And what's the maximum age for we'll Friday? Go, we'll go 105 for this one. 105 yeah, for this one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and tonight we have youth group. It's youth group for 9 through 12th graders. So it's a little bit different than our junior high youth group. That's why we do these things. So everybody can get some different uh, activities. So please come tonight if you can. It's at 630. So, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other announcements this morning before we begin? Let us prepare ourselves for worship. <laughs>
worship this day in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot bear ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. and peace to his people on earth. For God and faithful, God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Son of God, before us the love you have revealed in your Son, who prayed even for his enemies. In our words and deeds, help us to be like him, through whom we pray, Jesus Christ our Lord.
first lesson is from the 45th chapter of Genesis. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come, to, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you have sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will, there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, and the Lord of all his houses and rulers over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children, and your flocks, your herds, and all you have. There I will provide for you, for these are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. After his brothers talked with him. Here ends the reading. Psalm. Do not fret yourself because of evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and freed on its riches and feed on its riches. Commit your way to the Lord and put your trust in Him, and He will bring you to pass. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Refrain from anger. Leave rage alone. Do not fret yourself. It leads only to evil. In a little while, the wicked shall be no more. You shall, you shall search out their place, but, there will not, but they will not be there. But the deliverance of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord will help them and rescue them. He will rescue them from the wicked and deliver them. Because they seek refuge in him. The second lesson is from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. 
I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Here ends the reading. Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to one who strikes you on the cheek, Offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated and the children may come forward for the children's sermon. Hello. All right. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. How many of you like patience? No. No. How, how many of the big kids out there just love patience? Okay. I... I uh, your parents can't wait for you to move out. <laughs> wow. Patience is something that I always wish others would have with me, but I have trouble having patience myself. And I wish I were a more patient person. I always... I always wish that. Um, and, and there's that, that famous Amish prayer, you, you like this one. It's, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. Yes. Right? Yes. I know. Okay. And so it is. So it is. What helps us in, in times of trouble... In the bad times, when we're praying to God and we're asking God's help and deliverance and everything else, do you know what helps me have patience? Uh, because you're a pastor. Well, I wish it was because I was a pastor. Oftentimes, being a pastor actually makes me worse. Um, 
Yeah, 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 being an adult, I wish I could tell you it helps with patience. Well, okay, so having, having lost total control of this children's sermon and needing even more patience at this point, uh, of course, of course, what helps me have patience when it comes to waiting on the Lord, waiting for God's deliverance, waiting for God to come and help and rescue The thing that helps me is knowing who wins in the end. Jesus Jesus wins in the end. And so it is that our psalm says to wait patiently on the Lord. um, And we can wait patiently because of our second lesson. We know that in the end, God wins. And no matter how bad our lives happen to be, no matter how bad things happen to be, we know that God is the Lord of heaven and earth, and Jesus wins in the end. And, in, and there, when he comes again, there will be the resurrection of the living and the dead, and we will be his and live with him throughout all eternity. And so when I remember that, I know that I can have patience now because I know that Jesus wins in the end and Jesus loves you so very much that because he lives, we too shall live. And that is a glorious thing. Yeah, yeah, and death, death does happen. Death does happen. But we know that sin, death, and the devil do not win in the end. It is Jesus who is the Lord of life who will raise us on that final day and give us eternal life with him. And he is our hope, our strength, our might. And he loves you so very, very much. Now let's go back and sing the next hymn.
grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. I am not going to let you control my behavior. What do I mean by that? Okay. When someone hits you, you're trained by the world to hit them back. When somebody's mean to you, you're trained by the world to be mean to them back. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in this case, in the book of Luke, it's kind of fun because his sermon is actually on the plain, um, not the Sermon on the Mount, but it's Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. And in that, he says, you love your enemies. Christianity, once again, is not for sissies. There's nothing easy about it. It's tough. And yet... Christianity works every time it's tried. The problem with Christianity is it's not, wor- it's, not, it, it's not tried often enough. Christianity works every time it's, it's tried. And we look at him talking about loving your enemies. We, he's talking about forgiveness and what is, what is absolutely unique in Christianity is the power of forgiveness. The things of the world make for death. The things of Christ make for life. He is the Lord of life. And so it is that sin can bind us to the past. I mean, we can be all bound up to where we can't function in the present or the future. Because either we're feeling guilty over past sins that control our behavior in the present and the future, or we're licking our wounds from the past and 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 replaying over how we have been sinned in sinned against in the past, and it consumes our present and our future. The question is. Can we be freed from the past for the present and the future? Or are we bound by the past for the present and the future? Um, That's the problem. The past often determines our present and future realities, both positively and negatively. And sin binds. Jesus comes to free us from sin, death, and the devil. Forgiveness is that power that frees us from the past, both the guilt over past sins and the hurt from those have, who have sinned against us. And I was ready to, to come up with stories about the ways I have been hurt in the past and how I have forgiven, or the ways that I have sinned in the past and that those sins have weighed so heavy on me, and yet, of course, knowing that in Christ we are free. And, of course, that makes me the hero of all of those things, because, of course, I tell, you the way, these, I tell you these stories so that I'm the hero, of course, you know. Um, but the most beautiful example of all comes from the law, the Torah, Of course, those 13 chapters in Genesis known as the Joseph story. Now, of course, in the 12th chapter of Genesis, God goes to Abraham and says, Go to the land that I will show you, and I will bless you, and through you I will bless all nations. And Abraham listens to God, believes God, and follows him. And then, of course, he has Isaac. Um, Isaac meaning laughter, uh, because Sarah laughed at the idea of being pregnant at 90. Um, uh, um, Who here is 90 will admit it and wants to tell how anxious they are to be pregnant. Um, Yeah, uh, exactly. Um, And of course, Isaac, laughter, the joy that he brought to Abraham and Sarah. And then, of of course, Isaac and Rebekah 
and Re Rebecca has Jacob and Esau who are fighting in, in the womb. I mean, in the womb, they're fighting and kicking and scratching. And of course, in birth, they're headed, they're even fighting to get out. And, and the whole nine yards and through growing up, you know how it is um, uh, when it comes to siblings. And then, of course, Jacob, after stealing the birthright, he hightails it up to Uncle Laban's house and there he's promised work for me for seven years and I'll let you marry um, uh, Rachel. I was going to say Rebecca again. Rachel. And he loved Rachel with all his heart. And you know the beautiful love story that happened from there. He works, he slaves for Uncle Laban for seven years. And he works really, really hard because he is so smitten by, by Rachel. And on his wedding night, there's, they have a wonderful wedding night together. And who does he wake up with? Leah. Leah, the older sister, who he is not in love with. And he says to Laban, you tricked me. Well, I had to trick you because the older one has to be married before the younger. And so then he says, but relax. Work seven more years for me and you can have Rachel. And so he's trapped in a loveless marriage for seven years with Leah. Now that's Jacob is trapped. What is Leah doing? She's trapped in a loveless marriage with Jacob for seven years. And then, then everything really gets good for Leah, right? Because then she gets to share, you, you know, it's bad enough to be siblings, um, two sisters who are competing in so many, many and various ways, but then they get to be married to the same man. And Rachel is the love of Jacob. I mean, he loves her. And it is a beautiful love story. And Leah too. And then, of course, the two sisters start competing with children. And so Rachel, because Leah's having more, more kids, she, she gives her handmaid to lay with Jacob because it worked out so well when Abraham laid with Hagar, um, the handmaid of Sarah, because Sarah said, I can't have children here, lay with my handmaid. And, and of course, Ishmael was born, and 3,000, almost 4,000 years later, of course, um, the children of Ishmael and the children of, of um, Isaac are still warring. And so it is that they don't learn anything. And the next thing you know, there's Zilpa and Bilpa, the two handmaids. And all of the sudden, Jacob has 12 children. And how many of those children does he really, really, really love? Rachel gave him Joseph. And then, of course, Rachel later on gave him Benjamin. Um, one out of the 12 is all he cares about. And, and you talk about dumb. Jacob makes sure everybody knows that Joseph is really the one he loves. And everybody else, their chicken liver, or whatever, however you say it. Um, they don't care chopped liver um, and, and and so there there it is that of course um, Joseph this stupid spoiled boy he's a tattletale yeah, you know daddy uses him because he's so smart and he's so bright and daddy loves him so much that when the ten are off watching the sheep he sends Joseph to, to go spy on him and to come back and tattle on him in case they need tattled on. Now, how many of you like a tattletale? Oh, he almost caught you, huh? Yeah. Uh, no. Um, I mean, this guy's set up as a tattletale for his brothers. And then, then Jacob 
buys him a multicolored coat. He says, here's how much I love you and you only Joseph. And then Joseph, I told you he was a stupid boy. Um, he has the dreams. He has the dreams where he, there's those sheaves of wheat and his sheaf of, of wheat stands tall while the other sheaves of wheat are bowing down to him to his sheaf of wheat. Now what makes him dumb? Not that he had the dream, not that he understands the dream. He told his brothers the dream. How many think that they would like him more after the dream? Okay. See, this is a really easy one, right? Okay, then he has another dream. The moon, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars are all bowing down to him. And then he even uh, infuriates, had to watch my word choice, his father. Because his father's like, what do you mean we're going to be bowing down to you? But he, his father remembers the dream. And so then after this little interlude about how wonderful Joseph is and what a wonderful little, little snot he is, then when he's 17... Um, dad, they're down in, this, in southern Israel, um, at, in, around Hebron, and you go Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron, um, and, um, and dad, Jacob, says, says, hey, Joseph, aren't your brothers tending the sheep up north? And Joseph said, yeah, and he says, well, why don't you go check on them? And so Joseph trots up to Shechem, way up north, and, and he's looking around. They're not here. They're at Dothan. Now, Dothan, if this is the Mediterranean Sea, they're that way. So he heads over to Dothan, and the brothers see him coming. And no, How did they see him coming? He's got the nice coat. And they say, there's that little snot, that tat tattletale, that one who thinks he's better than us, and he's told us he's better than us, and he's told us that God thinks he's better than us. Let's kill him. And of course, you know, for, for, first that's idle talk. Ah, let's kill him. Then they think, why not? There's nothing we like about him. He's our half brother. He's not even a full brother. We might as well just kill him. And so that they start plotting. Okay, we're going to throw him in one, one of the pits and we're going to take his coat and all this stuff. And, and as they're plotting, Reuben, who is the oldest brother, Reuben says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is getting out of hand, guys. You know, let's just put him in a pit and, and, and tease him a little bit. And, and he's thinking, then I'm going to send him back to dad because this is getting out of hand. Well, they throw him in the pit. They take his coat. And, and so he's in the pit. And... There they are, I'm sure, plotting how they're going to kill him, what they're going to do with them. And, of course, when you're up on, on top, you're taunting, right? Because you don't like him one bit. And so you, you're, you're saying every mean thing about this guy because it's never going to get back to dad. And so you can, you can do all the psychological verbal warfare you want. Um, you know how mean siblings can be. And he's listening. And Reuben, of course, somehow he, he goes away and he comes back and he's gone. Reuben had planned to sneak him back to dad. And the next thing you know, he's gone. They decided, and I think it was Judah, decided to sell him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites who are coming down the coast, you know, they're traders, and they come down the coast, and they're headed to Egypt, sell them for 20 pieces of silver, and then they take his coat, and they kill a goat, and they, and they do the blood, and they say, Dad, look, what happened? We found this coat. What could it be? Isn't, aren't aren't half-truths marvelous lies? Um, they don't say, oh, look, he must be dead. They let Dad draw the conclusions. Dad cannot be consoled. 
He knows he's dead. He had to have been killed by a wild animal. All of this stuff. He cannot be consoled. But dad, we're your sons too. Don't you love us? Don't you care about us? No, all he cared about was Joseph. His only son is dead. And he doesn't care about the other ones and he cannot be consoled in any way, shape, or form. His life might as well be over. And his sons have to live with what they have done to their father. And at the same time, they have to be angrier at Joseph because he's all dad cared. Don't you care about me? And so Joseph goes down, and you know the story. He gets sold to Potiphar, who's the captain of, of Pharaoh's guard. And there he, he works up to, he's the chief steward. He's in, Potiphar has put him in charge of his entire household. He's a really bright boy. Now, when he was sold into slavery was when he was 17. And he goes down, Potiphar, um, success, Potiphar's wife, that little interlude there, makes it a nice R-rated story. We won't get into that. Um, he gets in trouble because she accuses him of bad things, and Potiphar, with a very heavy heart, throws him into Pharaoh's jail, where he meets, after a while, he works up his way up to being in charge of the jail. The jailer doesn't have to worry about a thing. He's in charge of the jail. He's a very bright boy. And... Um, then the butler, Pharaoh's butler and Pharaoh's baker are thrown into jail and they each have dreams and Joseph interprets the dreams for them. Well, the baker after three days will be hung and the butler after three days will be restored to Pharaoh's house. He'll be the cupbearer once again. And of course the butler says, oh, this is wonderful. I will remember you to Pharaoh as soon as I'm restored and guess what the butler forgets? To mention Joseph. And so Joseph stays two more years. Two more years in jail. And then Pharaoh has the dreams. The one is that, that the seven ears of wheat, the fat ears of wheat grow up. And then seven scrawny ears of wheat grow up and consume the seven fat ears. And then the seven fat cows come out of the Nile. And then the seven scrawny cows come up and consume. And all of Pharaoh's, um, all of Pharaoh's magicians, wise men, every, nobody knows what these dreams mean. And finally, the butler goes, oh, that's right. I was supposed to mention Joseph to you. He can, he can interpret your dream. Joseph comes in and he says, I don't interpret dreams. God interprets dreams. God gave you this dream, and here's God's interpretation. You know, the seven fat years of growing in the land, and then seven lean years when there will be famine, and they will totally consume the other seven years. And because, it, because you dreamed it twice, it's definitely going to happen. And what you need to do, Pharaoh, is put a wise person in charge of gathering up, first build these huge barns and then gather the grain into the barns and buy it when it's cheap, right? Supply and demand, when the supply is way up, the demand is low, buy cheap. And then when the famine hits, the demand goes way up and you can, you can sell it for whatever you want. This, you're gonna make a killing in, in the grain futures market. And so, of course, um, Pharaoh says, says, hmm, where can I find a wise man? And of course, he points right at Joseph. And now he's in charge of all of Egypt. And everything's going well. But then two years into it, of course, Jacob sends the boys down to Egypt for grain. We're running out of grain. So the boys come trotting down, um, trotting down to, to Egypt. And as they come trotting down to Egypt, of course, who's left behind but Benjamin? Because now Benjamin is the favorite, um, Rachel's only other son. And all that Jacob cares about now is Benjamin. And so they come down, and, and what, what happens? But all of a sudden, Joseph recognizes him. He's, he's old. He's dressed like an Egyptian. There's no way they're going to recognize this guy. 
and, and he speaks through an interpreter. And as he's speaking through an interpreter to the, to, to the ten brothers, um, all of a sudden, of course, he starts going, you guys are spies. You're coming to scope out the land. You're spying. You're gonna, you, there's an army somewhere around here. And I know what you're here for. You're spying on the land. They're like, we're just ten brothers. Our father is up in, uh, up in uh, Israel, only Canaan. And, uh, and our father's in Canaan with um, our youngest brother. And the one, he was killed. And so, of course, he keeps quizzing. I- is your father still alive? Ba 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 ba. And all of a sudden he says, that's it. Unless you bring the youngest of your brothers down here that I can see to prove that you're not spies, that you're really brothers, you forget it. And he keeps Simeon um, as a hostage, keeps one of the brothers as a hostage, and sends the other ones home. Well, they get home, they open up their grain sacks, and what do they find in those grain sacks? Their money. And they start to freak out. I forgot to tell you a minor detail. While they're talking to Joseph through the interpreter, and he's accusing them as spies, Reuben turns to the brothers and says in Hebrew, he he turns to the brothers and he he says, all this trouble he's giving us is because of what we did to Joseph, and his blood is coming down on our heads today because of this. Joseph, of course, hears this and understands, even though they think he can't under. He has to leave, and he goes and he cries, and then he comes back with a straight face again. So now they're home, and they're they're freaking out because of the money. Reuben, you see how the weight of the blood of Joseph is weighing on his head. There is guilt upon guilt. And so... They eat up all the grain. They consume all the grain. It's time to go back. And Jacob says, you guys got to go back, get more grain, or we're going to die. And they say, hey, we can't go back without Benjamin. And Jacob's like, I already lost Joseph. I'm not losing Benjamin. And they negotiate with him. Reuben says, says, everything that is mine, my, my own son's, are yours if I, I promise I will bring him back. And they, they all make promises to him. And Jacob, why should he believe any promises? They can't control everything. Finally, he agrees for Benjamin to go back to Egypt with them. And there, of course, is Joseph. And he looks and he sees Benjamin. And he looks and he sees his brothers who don't recognize him. Through the interpreter, of course, he's talking with them. He sends them home with the money again in their sacks and his own cup in Benjamin's sack. And they get about a day's, he lets them go about a day's journey and in order to test them. And then he has them arrested and brought back. And they open up the sacks And Benjamin has stolen his cup. And they're all like, I mean, they're speechless. They don't know what to say. And Reuben says, look, look, all of us are in your hands. You know, and and Joseph says, no, I'm a reasonable person. I'm just going to keep the one who stole my cup. And the ten are beside themselves. What do they do? Judah. Judah speaks up and he says, look, look, we promised our dad. Benjamin has to return or he will die. He will die from grief. We cannot do this to our father. You take me instead. If you have to take someone, take me. And at that point, Joseph realizes that the brothers are willing to sacrifice themselves for Benjamin. They have actually passed a test. And so 
at that point, he chases out all the Egyptians from the house and he begins to weep. And he looks at his brothers and he says, I am Joseph. Now, do the brothers leap for joy? Yay, our brother was lost and now he's found. No, that is the... We know what we did to him. And now he's here and we're here and we're in his hands. And oh, are we going to get it? Because he owes us. He owes us and we deserve it. And he says, I am Joseph, your brother. They can't even speak. They can't even speak. And they have no idea what's going to happen to them. And Joseph says, so it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up and get my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, which is the, the nicest of the land. I mean, it is the breadbasket of the breadbasket. Um, and, and he says all of these things. Meanwhile, the brothers are still like, oh my gosh. You know, he has just forgiven them. Everything that they did to him and they know what they deserve. And you see in the words of Reuben and Judah and everyone else, all the guilt that has been weighing on them all these years. And Joseph should have been smacking his lips and waiting and basking in all the hurt and the pain from his brothers, vowing to get even, vowing vengeance. And you see this forgiveness. Joseph says, no, you didn't sell me into Egypt. God sold me into slavery in Egypt that I might save the world. And forgiveness is proclaimed to them. And everything is right. Right? Not so. They bring dad down. They live in the fat Goshen, the, the best of the, of the bread basket of the bread basket. And then dad dies. Jacob dies. And they go and they bury him. They come back. And now the ten are saying, holy cow, holy cow. He's been waiting till dad died. We know the shoe's going to drop. And it's going to hit like, a, like that 16-ton Acme anvil. And it's, it's headed straight for us. We know, we know that he is going to get us now. Chapter 50. This has been going on for 13 chapters. I know the sermon seems like it's been going on for 16 or 17 chapters. But when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Isn't this cool how they're putting words in their dead dad's, dad's mouth? And Joseph knows better. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Why did they weep? Why did Joseph weep? He realizes for how many years his brothers had to have been having that axe over their heads, the guilt over their heads, knowing that at some point they were going to have to pay for their sin. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. The same thing that Reuben had said when 
he was going to take Benjamin and Benjamin only. But Joseph said to them, do not fear for am I in the place of God as for you. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Sin has a way of binding us to the past in very destructive ways. Whether it's the sins of others against us, the purpose of forgiving is to be freed from those hurts from the past. Not to, not to, to look at the wounds and the scars from the past and be focused on those things. When we forgive others, we're, we free ourselves from the past. And when we are forgiven, then, of course, we are freed from the past as well, from that guilt. The power of Jesus Christ is the power of forgiveness. He has conquered sin, death, and the devil once and for all on the cross. Satan always wants to come and remind us of our past sins and remind us of the sins of others and to try to keep, keep us focused and bound by the past so that he can destroy our present, destroy our future. But we know if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And the Son has set us free. That's the power of Christ's forgiveness. He sets us free from the past so that we can live for him in the future. Only Jesus Christ can truly free us from our past. He died that we might be made right with God, and through him, he has transferred us from the power of sin, death, and the devil into the power of his light, his life, and his salvation, the power of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through, through Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let us confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
drawn to the light of Christ, made bold in the waters of baptism, and filled with the Spirit, we lift up our praise and confidence that God loves and listens to us. Lord, you made the church to be a net gathering people together. Empower us through your Holy Spirit to proclaim your gospel with clarity and fervor. Make good your purpose to us, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Restore the faith and health of all who are burdened by suffering of body, mind, and spirit, especially Michael Martin, Blake Hallett, Mary Abate, Diane Sundberg, William Rush, John Gray, Carrie Rogers, Kendall Ignatz, Virginia Dodd, Linda Hallett, Kylie Zern, Bill Gallagher, Beverly Steffi, Patricia Gray, Rob McCluskey, Pam Schreckengoss, Derek Kohler, and Larry Means. And all those we named before you, both spoken and silently. Strengthen all who care for them, and grant them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the unemployed and underemployed. Grace them with full employment, O God. Set them to work that they may know the joy that labor brings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our troops, police, and first responders serving around the world, watchful God, especially Zach Steiner, Kendall Ignatz, Char Charles Merriman, Jacob McMasters, Joshua Dixon, and Brett Nyman. Grant that their mission of peace might be successful and that they may return home safely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all the counselors and pastors and others who work to repair relationships and restore communities. Help them to, to listen deeply and speak wisely, to seek your will for the people in their care, and to model your love in the way they serve others. Lord, in your mercy, embrace the people of this congregation with your holy and forgiving love. Make us eager to seek out those estranged from us, impatient in the work of reconciliation. Let all we say and do shine with love for Jesus and with Jesus' love for everyone we meet. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank and praise you for the food that is prepared for us. Draw near to bless us through, through the food, the fellowship, this time together. Uh, that is prepared for us, that we might be strengthened to serve you always. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our day. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.